347. Ring the bells of heaven. There is joy today for a soul returning from the world. We'll sing the verses 1 and 3, remaining C. 3, 4, 7. <laughs>
Lord's help as we meet together and receive the Lord's face of prayer. Our gracious Father, thank thee, dear Lord, for the privilege we have this evening to come and to meet together again in the house of the Lord. Thank thee that we are able to draw nigh on to thee in prayer. We approach thee on all the basis of the person and work of thy dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we thank thee for him who is the Father's delight, the one whom the Father was able to say of, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. O oh Lord, we thank thee for the pleasure given in the obedience of thy Son. And o oh Lord, we thank thee for the satisfaction that there is in him. That today as he has finished his work of redemption and ascended up on high, that as I to see us, I delight us in us as well, stand amazed at such a truth that as we see filth of our own sin, as we see our continual failing, how amazing, thou wouldst look upon us and see us as righteous. Yet we thank thee that the righteousness is what imputed to us. Pray, dear Lord, that the gospel will take hold of us again this evening. Pray that in this season of worship we will be taken up with Christ. Pray, Lord, that we will be helped to apply the great truths taught in the Word. Pray that Thy Word then will come with fresh power and authority to each heart gathered in. O oh Lord, we pray this evening that Thou will be pleased to come and speak to us at the point of need. We recognize that we all have come to this meeting with different problems, different trials that we're passing through, yea, even different delights. Yet we thank thee that your word is able to come and meet us all at the point of our individual need. And to that end, we pray mighty intervention of the Spirit of God in this meeting. Pray that the power of God will come down mightily upon us. O oh Lord, we look to thee that thou will be pleased to bless the work of God in these dark and difficult days. I were longing for times of reviving and refreshment. <coughs> of thy work we pray. Come and favour Zion pray that we will have much cause to rejoice in the arm of God being made there. So come to graciously undertake, we pray in our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn again in our hymn books, please, to the words of the hymn 615. 615, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. 615, and we'll stand together as we sing these words.
please, in God's Word to 1 Corinthians and the chapter 12. 1 Corinthians and the chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read in this chapter from the verse 12. First Corinthians 12 and the verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not of the, uh, sorry, I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now if God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body? The eye cannot see, sorry, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are in the body of Christ members in particular. God hath sent some in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Of all the gifts of healing? Do you all speak with tongues? Do you all interpret? Covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And then there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We're going to have the Catechism now. It's the last time we were looking at the question relating to the doctrine of the Trinity, and I mentioned that we cannot fully grasp the, uh, the teaching that there is in the doctrine of the Trinity. We, we understand what the words mean, but uh, we can't fully grasp in our minds how it is one God and yet three persons. We believe it to be true, and yet cannot fully comprehend it, if we could, we would be God. And so this question 10, again, is, is showing us various things that we cannot fully grasp, and yet we believe the Word of God to teach them. So what are the personal properties of three persons in the Godhead? It is proper to the Father to beget His Son, and to the Son to be begotten of the Father, and to the Holy Ghost to proceed from the Father and the Son from all eternity. 
And these words have to be kept in the context of what we saw last time, that the persons are equal in the Godhead. There is that equality between the persons. There is an order, and yet there is equality. Now, some of what is discussed in this answer was part of a controversy that led to the division of what is often referred to the Western and the Eastern Church in 1054. And so that was effectively the, the break between Rome and the Eastern Orthodox churches. And though there was much more to that than uh, some of the truths that are set forth in this answer, that was the climactic issue. And it had to do with the procession of the Holy Spirit. And so at the end of that, at the answer here to the Holy Ghost to proceed from the Father and the Son from all eternally. And so the Orthodox position is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from Father and Son. Um, but the Orthodox churches don't hold to the Orthodox position. And so it's a bit of a misnomer. And when the Orthodox churches take that position, they don't hold to the Orthodox position here. They say that the Holy Ghost proceeded only from one of the persons of the Trinity. And the Bible does speak of the Father sending and operating through the Son and the Spirit. And it also speaks of the Son sending and working through the Spirit. So the Father has sent the Son. He Worked and is working through him. The Father has sent the Spirit, is working through him. The Son has spoke of how he would send the Spirit. The Spirit would come in his name. And uh, here we have this idea of an order because we do not see anything about the Son working through the Father or the Holy Spirit sending or working through the Son. And so there is this equality that scripture sets forth and yet there is order. To mention this issue of the Son, it is proper to the Father to beget the Son and to the Son to be begotten of the Father. We believe that scripture teaches that Christ is the eternally begotten Son. And if you look with me in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, John chapter 1 of the verse 14. John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 18, no man had seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him, that is the Son is declared declared the Father. And John 3, 16, we have again this word begotten. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And at the end of verse 18, it speaks of those who have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now some of the modern translations translate this only as the only Son. That so it says something like, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But the authorized version very deliberately used this word, begotten. The original Greek is monogenes. And so the first part of it has to do with the only. But the genes then has to do with this idea of procession, of being begotten. And Christ then, he is the eternally begotten Son. He is being sent by the Father. The Spirit has been sent by the Father and the Son. And so there is this order in the Godhead and yet the equality in the Godhead remains. So trust the Lord and bless those few thoughts to our hearts. Thank you all for coming this evening. It's good to see each one met with us. We appreciate you come, coming despite the heat this evening, and thank you all for coming into the house of the Lord.
the Lord. May the Lord be pleased to come and minister to all of our hearts. I omitted uh, to mention this morning in relation to the work in Pakistan. And we have been asking you to pray that the Lord will provide a place for some teaching of uh, poor children there in Pakistan. And uh, hopefully tomorrow uh, people there in Pakistan will be able to secure a property for the next few months to, to carry out this teaching. And so we do, we do appreciate your prayers for that. It's a little more than what we had originally intended, about $100 per month to rent that place. Uh, but it will be available every day for teaching these children. And to do pray that the Lord will bless that uh, ministry in Pakistan. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please, to the words of the hymn 319. 319. Sing these words, the offering for the work of God will be received. 319, far away the noise of strife above, my ear is falling, then I know the sins of earth beset on every hand. We'll remain seated as we sing these words. <laughs>
statement. Uh, I got the digits the wrong way around when I was typing that in. Uh, do you have what beautiful words those are? The hymn writer there referring to the text of the book of Isaiah. Speaking of Beulah, the word meaning married, we've been joined in to Christ. And what a blessing there is in our union with Him, which does fit with what we're going to be talking about somewhat at least in Isaiah 33 this evening. Isaiah, sorry not Isaiah, Psalm 133. It's more than my fingers not working right. So it's Psalm 133. Psalm 133. Only one more of the songs of degrees after this one that we are going to consider this evening. Psalm 133, a song of degrees, David, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garments. Jew of Hermon, and as the Jew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded blessing, even life forevermore. We will seek the Lord's days together again in prayer. Let us pray that the Lord will take his word this evening and bread upon each one. Our gracious Father, we thank thee, dear Lord, for the privilege to come before thy word this evening. What beautiful words we have before us. We pray for the help of the Spirit of God to take these words and to have them applied to our hearts. O oh Lord, we pray that we might be instructed and helped through thy truth. Our Lord Jesus said, By this, by love, shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. And those words are surely a strong rebuke to the Church of Christ in our day. We are often lacking in love. And as a consequence, we are often lacking in unity. There is a false unity that abounds, a false unity that we are opposed to, a unity based on the lowest common denominator, a unity that says we all believe in God so we can all meet together and worship together, set all of our differences aside. And so under the false ecumenism of today, those who believe in works salvation can supposedly meet and worship with those that meet in salvation by grace alone. Those who believe in Christ's deity can supposedly worship with those that deny it. Those who rest upon the atoning work of Christ for salvation can supposedly worship with those that reject that so necessary truth. Now, that is not true you know. That is mixing truth with error. John a Trapp, an old writer, said, Unity without verity, that is unity without truth, is no better than conspiracy. While we oppose the apostate and the ecumenical movement, it's not reason for us to ignore the necessity of genuine Christian unity. Unity among true believers is something that we are to yearn for. So the psalmist says here, Behold! And the very usage of that word, behold, is to grab our attention. Look at this! Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to 
well together. And you know, to, uh, the psalmist then here is emphasizing this is something that we are to yearn for. He is setting forth the desirability of unity. Now the words at the end of verse 3, there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore, or some have translated it, there the Lord commanded the blessing of life forevermore. And these words really flow from verse 1. So we could read it that way, verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, because there the Lord commands the blessing. Verse 2 and the first part of verse 3 are in parenthesis. We could put them in brackets, not because they're all important. Verses 2 and the beginning of verse 3 are illustrating the truth that is being set forth in verse 1. And so we have two illustrations. We will come to these during the course of the message. The first illustration is that unity is like oil being poured in the head of the high priest. The second illustration, it's like dew. A dew that would descend from Mount Hermon in the north right down to Zion in Judah in the south. When we tie all of what we have in this psalm together, I believe what David is teaching us here is the times of unity among Christian brethren among God's people, male and female, they are days of heaven on earth. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And those words forevermore are surely bringing us to consider heaven. They are bringing us to consider eternity and heaven will be the place of perfect unity when we reach heaven we will be able to say in every day not just theoretically but from our experience when we get to heaven how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity that will be a wonderful thing and yet the psalmist is urging us not to wait until we get to heaven to think about Christian unity. We are to strive after it here while we live on earth. We are to long for days of heaven on earth. The gospel then in a sense is set forth in this psalm. It's sin that has caused a broken relationship. So it's sin that has caused the broken relationship between God and Man, following from that, sin has caused broken relationships between man and man, between people and people. Why is it difficult to retain unity? It's because of sin. But then we're reminded that grace restores. For man has been brought into union, that is, the Christian has been brought into union with God and thereby unity with God. The ultimate evidence of that will be heaven. There is no division there. But as we've said, we are to strive for days of heaven and earth. I want to say, first of all, these days are to be sought. So days of unity, days of this heaven and earth, they are days that we are to be seeking for as God's people. I've already mentioned that verse 1 is emphasizing this is something that is desirable. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's good. It's pleasant. And surely the psalmist is implying the opposite is also true. Behold how bad and unpleasant it is for brethren to be in a place of disharmony. Does the story of Abraham and Lot and their herdsmen, their farmers, illustrate that matter? Remember how there was conflict between these different groups of herdsmen? 
and the conflict came such that Abraham had to speak to Lot about it. Abraham said to Lot in Genesis 13, 8, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee. Let there be an end of strife, because the strife was bad and unpleasant. In that case, the strife was ended by a parting of ways. It brought an end to the disunity in the sense that the strife had now stopped. But that resolution didn't actually bring Abram and Lot went their separate ways. They could live at peace with each other if they lived apart. And isn't that the reality? In the evangelical church today, we can live at peace if we're apart from each other. But that's not true, you know that? This unity is unpleasant. Remember that rebellion that Absalom had against David. And after the death of Absalom, it was that call for David to come back to Jerusalem. In 2 Samuel 19, verse 14, the heart of all the men of Judah was bowed, even as the heart of one man. And so here was a great number. And they were united together again. And they made this common request, David, come again to Jerusalem. And some commentators believe that that's the context for David writing these words in Psalm 133. David saw at that point how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God's blessing is commanded in such times. I suggested in these studies that these psalms are related to Hezekiah, not that he wrote them, certainly he didn't write them all. This psalm and some of the others are, were written by David. But I suggest that Hezekiah may have been the one that compiled, as it drew together, this particular collection. Second Chronicles 30 verse 12. It says, also in Judah the hand of God was to give them one heart. To do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. Give them one heart. And Hezekiah saw how pleasant it is for God's people to dwell together in unity. And some years later, after God's people came back out of captivity and came back to Jerusalem... We read of the idea of unity among those that were gathered in Jerusalem. For example, Ezra verse three, sorry, Ezra chapter three, verse one. It talks about the seventh month being come. The people gathered themselves together as one man. And here were people just like us tonight, different personalities, different backgrounds, different preferences. And yet they gathered together that day as one man. They set aside those differences. They united together by good and by pleasant. For brethren to dwell together in unity. Nehemiah 8 verse 1. All the people gathered themselves together as one man. We are to pray as we saw earlier in these psalms, for the peace of God's church, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. A vital part of that will be pray for our unity. It's pleasant. It's good. These days are to be sought. Then I want to see, secondly, God has the authority to give these days. God has the authority to give days of heaven and earth, as it were. For if you notice with me at the end of verse 3, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And so, if we know anything of these 
days of heaven and earth, they are days of great blessing. Where this unity is accompanied with great blessing. And the argument that David is presenting here is not merely live in unity and you will enjoy blessing. Though that is true. Rather he is saying live in unity and God will ensure times of blessing. Live in unity. God will ensure times of blessing. God commands it. There the Lord commandeth blessing. This word command is often used in scripture with this idea of authority. And God instructed Adam and Eve not to eat the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Is this word God commanded. Don't eat it. God was showing his authority. When God said to Noah to build the ark, God commanded him. God had the authority. And through the books of the law, we read this word continuously, commanded. God was giving his law. It was not merely advice. God was giving a command. God was showing his authority. And so it is here. God has the authority to command blessing upon his people. And God has the authority to move among a congregation like this. To command the days of blessing to come. And we see that surely illustrated in this matter of the Jew in Verse 3, Jew as in D-E-W, the water, as the Jew of Hermon is the Jew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Uh, we think about the morning Jew, God has designed it. God sends it. He has the right to withhold it. The scripture makes, speaks much about that. God has the authority to withhold the Jew. To hear then, surely we are to pray. Lord, as thou hast the authority to send down the Spirit. Send the Spirit that there might be indeed death's blessing. God has the authority so to do. But I want to come there thirdly and see that these days come on the basis of our union with Christ. And these days come on the basis of our union with Christ. And again, I want you to think of these two illustrations. We'll take the first of them first of all. And so in verse 2, it is like the precious ointment. And so the ointment was oil that was infused with fragrance. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that ran down to the skirts of his garments. Who was Aaron? Aaron was the high priest. And in the Old Testament, the high priest, in order to enter into his office, to fulfill the work of his office, he had to be anointed. There had to be this pouring of oil upon his head. And so this is the image then before us in verse 2. The anointing of the head of the high priest. And evidently when the high priest was anointed, it wasn't just one or two drops of oil. For the oil was poured out and it ran down his beard and then right down onto his clothing. It says there it went down to the skirts of his garments. It went down even to the very bottom of the clothing. The oil was running down from the head onto the body. Every part of the body is where it is affected. And the oil here is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. And oil in Scripture so often does symbolize the Holy Spirit. And remember, Aaron is the high priest. 
he was not fulfilling all that God had in view in the high priest. So Aaron had a very important function to fulfill. But his function was really to point forward to another. The great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. And here then we have something that takes us beyond Aaron and the other high priests that followed. We have Christ here. It is like the precious ointment upon the head. And here we have Christ then anointed with the Spirit. And as Christ who is our, our head, as he is anointed, the oil flows down. The oil flows down right as it were onto the body. That's why we read 1 Corinthians 12 earlier in the meeting where there is that emphasis between the head and the body. The church is the body. We have this head that is Christ. Our head has been anointed. The Spirit then flows down onto the body on the basis of what Christ as our head has done for the body, what he is to the body. Acts chapter 10, the verse 38 Peter speaks there of how God anointed, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. And Christ, as he fulfilled his ministry then, he fulfilled it in that anointing of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord showed that in Luke chapter 4 as he set out in his ministry. He had been baptized, remember how the Spirit descended in the form of a dove. Remember how then he went out into the wilderness, he was tempted, and he came then to the synagogue, and he read from the book of Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach. He's anointed me. Christ's ministry then was fulfilled in this anointing. But the oil did not remain on Christ only. As our Saviour went to Calvary, as he gave himself for us, as he fulfilled that atoning work of the cross, then rose again, ascending to glory, and presented all of his work of redemption in heaven. What happened? Spirit was outpoured Pentecost. And so we could say then that our high priest was anointed. That oil flowed down onto his body, flowed down onto his church. Surely we can speak in the sense of Christ having ascended, of him being anointed. I mentioned how this ointment is oil that is infused with fragrance. What a welcome there was for our, our Saviour as he ascended to heaven. What a beautiful fragrance. And yet this holy oil, that is the Holy Spirit of God, has descended upon his church. We have actually an emphasis on that idea of descending in the psalm. If you look with me towards the end of verse 2, it speaks of this oil having gone down and went down to the skirts of his garments. And then verse 3, the Jew descended. It's the same Hebrew word. The Jew went down. And in that particular figure of the Jew, it was going down geographically. And so the Holy Spirit has come down. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the church. Now you and I here are converted. The day of our conversion, we received this word. We were baptized into that body. Now, I'm not there referring to the water baptism, though water baptism is vitally important to symbolize that. But we were baptized into that body of Christ. The Spirit of God 
given to us. We're stamped by the Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit. But we are then to know that continual infilling. We are to continually draw from Christ. We are to know more of a fullness of the Spirit of God. Remember, the Spirit of God can be grieved. So it can be that a group of people meet together as a company of God's people. And they're all indwelt by the Spirit of God. Yet the factions that are among them grieve the Holy Spirit. There is a losing out of what the Lord could give. But we are always to remember this that we will never merit the oil. We will never merit the blessing. It comes on the basis of our union our blessed Lord. Our focus then is to be on Him. N.W. Tizer used the illustration of piano tuning and he talked about if there were 100 concert pianos and the piano tuner tuned the first and then he tuned the second to the first, the third to the second, the fourth to the third, fifth to the fourth and so on. When all of those pianos now begin to play, there will be this harmony. But if the tuner tunes each of the pianos to his tuning fork, when they begin to play, they will all be in perfect harmony. So if we merely try to tune ourselves to each other, the unity will not be attained. But we are to be in tune with Christ. And as we are in tune with Him and in Him, we are enabled to be in tune with one another. And as we see our union in Christ, as I see you as a brother or sister united to Christ, then I can be Person. The Lord blesses that. There the Lord commands the blessing. As we think of this oil descending, it doesn't it take us right back to Calvary where there was another vial different from this oil of blessing. Where the vial of God's wrath was brought to break upon our Savior's head. He bore all of the wrath that was our due. And now there comes to us this sweet ointment. An ointment that is full of fragrance. I have mentioned that this oil was full of a blend of oh, oil. It's a blend of fragrances. The ladies looked at this last year in the ladies' Bible study. Surely the blessing that comes upon us is a beautiful blend of God's love, God's goodness, God's mercy, God's forbearance. What a beautiful, sweet ointment descends upon the church. Before we move on, I want you to see that that oil is it descended. It says it went down to the very skirts of his garments. And isn't there a very practical way that we can apply what David is saying here? And there may be someone in the meeting tonight, and, and you feel yourself to be, as Paul described himself, the least of all the saints. And you feel yourself to be the lowest of the low. Perhaps you feel yourself to be the least equipped of the least equipped. The oil flowed down to the very head as it were of the garment. There's a supply for the humblest believer. 
Uh, surely that's most beautifully pictured there at Pentecost. Whereas the oil did descend, who was the one that rose up to speak? It was Peter. The very one that had denied the Lord. He may have felt himself at that time to, or afterwards, to be the weakest of the eleven. And yet the Lord was pleased to take him and use him. The oil descended to the heavens where. We think of Mary as she came and sat at the Lord's feet. In their home in Bethany, it's a good place to take. The oil flows to the very feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are many things to undermine unity. Self-centeredness will undermine unity. Our pride will undermine unity. Sometimes we can think, I've got that thing right, and... These other brethren, they, they haven't got it fixed yet in their minds. And that pride can undermine unity. It could be a passionate spirit. It could be scheming and plotting against others in the work of God. What is it that will bring us to a place of unity and thereby bless? has to be this focus on Christ. I want to say then, fourthly, these days are demonstrated in profitable service. These days are demonstrated in profitable service. Now, the high priest was anointed so that he could do his work. Now, the high priest was forbidden to enter into his service and to go about fulfilling those duties without first having been consecrated into that service. It began with the anointing. So our blessed Lord is the high priest. Even he setting out in his earthly ministry, he set out with that special anointing upon him. The oil enabled service. And the garment that the high priest had at his feet was the white linen coat. But then above that, there was the blue robe, most reckoned that it came midway between the knees and the ankles. So before the oil got down onto that white linen inner coat, it had to flow over the blue robe. Remember that blue robe is the one that had the bells and pomegranates on it. In Exodus 28, verse 35, speaking of this blue robe, it says, It shall be upon Aaron to minister. Now, this blue robe is there so that he might serve. Exodus 39, 26, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Now, that is all right, the bottom of this particular garment. Now, there was a little bell, then a little symbol of pomegranate, a bell of pomegranate, so on the whole way around, right about the hemp road, to minister in, as the Lord commanded Moses. And again, what has been emphasized is this blue robe was for service. Before the oil reached the feet, then it went over the place. And what we're being taught then here is this. That where there is unity among God's people, the oil comes down. We are enabled to serve. The Lord commands a blessing. This is the testimony after testimony of those that have, in God's mercy, experienced times of revival. Where there was unity among God's people, Spirit came down. There was a laboring, there was service, there was intercession. The Lord commanded the blessing. There's a blessing here. Isn't this also evident in that second illustration of the Jew? As the Jew of Hermon and the Jew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. 
So many of the plants of that landscape were dependent upon the dew. That was their source, water. So as the snow would melt on Mount Hermon, the water would descend down that mountain. The dew then would be carried from Mount Hermon down into southern parts of the land. Plants were dependent upon it. That was their source of water. If they didn't have the dew, they couldn't perform. The fruit trees would not have the fruit. They wouldn't be able to fulfill the purpose that they were designed for. So then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Peter stood forth to preach, to serve. And the days that followed were the days of great blessing. The Lord indeed commanded the blessing. Acts 2 44. All that believed were together. Together. And that all things come, they shared. Acts 4, 32, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, for they had all things come. It was unity. It was blessing. And surely we would never deny that we are in need of blessing today. We are in need of days of heaven and earth. And we can read about times of revival, and it's good that we do. Our hearts are encouraged in seeing what the Lord has done in past days, and yet we yearn that the Lord would do it again. This psalm is saying, let's dwell together. That we might know the oil of God. That we might know the Jew. That we might know times of refreshment, fruitfulness as the Jew would bring. Hosea 14 4, the Lord said, There I will heal their backsliding. The church today needs to be healed of her backsliding. The next verse says, I will be as the Jew. to do so in this congregation. May the Lord maintain and promote further that unity that exists among us. May the Lord be pleased that the Spirit of Light and David descend on the May the Lord bless his word to all our hearts. Amen. I'd like to turn closing to Psalm 133 in the hymn book. Psalm 133 in the hymn book, page 124. Behold how good a thing it is, and how becoming well together such as brethren are in unity to dwell. Psalm 133, and we'll stand together as we sing these words of praise.
Father, we give thee thanks that the Lord does command blessing. And this is what we yearn for, dear Lord. We, we yearn that if I would command blessing over us, Lord, we pray then that we will be helped to obey the duties in this psalm. O oh Lord, we thank Thee for our union with Christ. And we look to Thee on the basis of what our Lord has done for us. And that there will be that pouring out of the oil. The descending of the dew. O oh, come, we pray. And leave us not to our own devices. We pray that we will know days of heaven. Pray even in this week that is before us, that we will be held to run well and to testify of the grace of God. Beyond to Him, who is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power.